you, folks. Welcome back to Dom Avenue. This is Chris once again. Now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Chris White Reports. This is Chris in Central Pennsylvania with a special guest tonight. He's been a guest on the program before. Let me just get him up here. I'm going to ask him to unmute. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the heartthrob of Ashrira Rai and Madhuri Dixit. He is the national spokesman for Mahindra Tractors and the national director of operations for Mittal Steel. None other than Karu Charu. Hey, what's up, brother? Well, I'm well, you forgot to uh, mention that I'm... Uh... CEO and waiting at Tesla as well. No, and, no, no. Uh, Come on, man. That's not Indian. That doesn't count. Can only be Indian companies. You got to stick with the stereotypes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, but we will mention that, but that's fine. So I'm just getting my stuff ready here. Yeah. That's all right, folks. Now, oh, now, now, it's a typical Indian operation. There's 37 family members in the room making sure it goes off smoothly. We know how it works there. <laughs> yes, yes. I've, got, I've got catering done. I've got technical. <laughs> Um, then I've got family members who are watching. There you and go. They come from all around the country because obviously I'm live. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome back to the program, folks. Listen, uh, Karu, Charu, and I have uh, talked previously a few times. Lots been happening, and um, he's messing with some technical stuff there. But I got a lot of questions for him today, and we'll get to what happened to his Facebook business page. That one I'm curious about. Hopefully, you can tell me without blowing up my channel on the Poo Tube. But hey, listen. Uh, before we get into it, um, how are you doing? How's the family? How's life? Are you okay? You look healthy. Let's just first get first thing straight. Let's just get the um, the, the 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 name right so that we. I educate. I know you're coming uh, here, we, here we go. He's going to make me pronounce it correctly. Coming, I, know coming, I, know coming, I know you're coming to South Africa in sometime in August, September, like that, and we're going to share hot curry. Yes, uh, actually, going to be a hot, hot, hot curry. That's what we do here. We not, 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 hot, not hot, that hot white curry. people curry. <laughs> nah, real stuff. And then we're going to go with this now. So you're going to go with me. Yep. Like so, the name first name is Caro, as in car. 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 And row. Row. Caro. 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 There we go. Okay. Then as in Charo. Ah, you say Char. Yeah. And then row. Caro. Yeah. It says right. Caro. Yeah. Charo. Charo. There you go. Caro Charo. There you go. You see? But it's not spelled that way. <laughs> I can, give you, I can give you some words in Welsh not spelled that way, but sound very Well, different. we could put some words in Afrikaans not spelled the way they're pronounced either up on the board. <laughs> 100%, yeah. 100% on that one, yeah. So, what yeah. were you asking me? You're asking me... Um, no, I, I was... How's the family? How are things? You look well. Well, as well as can be, um, we are in... Whatever we are, we make peace where we are and just try to live uh, life day to day. And yeah, so we've been through a lot of, lot of stuff, but... You have to keep plugging away and making sure we do what we need to do. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you this question before we get into the political stuff. So, uh, for folks who don't know, you're, you're also a comedian. Um, you're also an independent journalist. Uh, I'd call you that. Certainly, your reporting has been is pretty bit quality and uh, unbiased, uh, a lot of what I've seen. Uh, obviously, we bring our own bias into reporting, and, and when we do that, we're honest. I, when I've seen you being, uh, what I'd say, a little bit biased, you're honest about it. You, you tell people where you stand, and it's the same with me. But but uh, you are a comedian, and I think a lot of people outside South Africa don't realize that. So, um, are you able to, once again, book gigs? with the end of the restrictions on assemblies and gatherings in South Africa? Are you looking at a comedy tour? Is that is that something you're doing? Yeah, I've, I've, in a way, I've moved away. COVID taught me that uh, a lot of entertainers that entertainment used to be my lifestyle. It was my it was my core business. And uh, COVID taught us that uh, I cannot rely on that being my core business. So entertainment is now becoming my sideline business, so to speak. So I'm spending a lot of time setting up other stuff where I can earn a, earn a living in case I'm unable to perform as an entertainer. And my life is also taking a bit of a trajectory into the uh, activism, sort of political activist sort of um, route. So I have to back off from certain things. But yes, there is a comedy tour coming up with some other artists that's in the pipeline. Look, entertainment is my game. I don't think I'll go totally away from it. Um, yeah, but that's, that's where I am at the moment. Well, I, will people ever discover during your tour that you know, your name isn't really Karu Charu, but rather Dinesh D'Souza? I don't think they'll figure that out. 
<laughs> that's only for those who have higher grade education. So it's a bit of yeah. I don't think. I'm, so so you know, so, you know. so no entry level, um, you know, uh, matric passing with thirty percent South African university students. We're not talking about those folks. <laughs> no, no, we're not talking. We're not talking. We're not talking about those folks. You know, when you do when you when you do the thirty percent thirty percent scenario. Um, I always use a very cheap joke to say to get it across, but it, it gets a message across. It's about a guy who did a, you know, now in South African education to do science is a big thing because no one wants to do science and really no one wants to do math. So I met this guy, a new millennial, he just passed uh, our high grade matric year and he did science and he had a good degree and a good symbol. And I thought, man, this is fantastic to have a child doing science. Getting so I said to him, in a thunderstorm, first you see the lightning. And then a second later, you hear the thunder. I said, first you see the flash and then you hear the thunder. I asked him, what is the science behind that? He says, well, the science behind you see the lightning and then you hear the thunder because your eyes are in front of your ears. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a 30% uh, answer that we're going to get here in South Africa. Would you explain why we are in the situation we are in? Why things don't get done? The way it's supposed to get done, and uh, yeah, we can laugh about it, but actually, quite a serious matter that we end up in. Yeah, no, it's quite a sad thing. Uh, that and also the rampant, obvious uh, state-sponsored discrimination against minorities, Indians and whites in particular, but also coloreds, which has driven a lot of engineers and technicians and scientists and medical practitioners out of the country and lots of other issues. But we could get into that a little bit later. But let me ask you this question. You are my sole source for this because News 24, Daily Maverick, uh, Rapport, uh, IOL, week in August, none of these papers seem to carry this story. What's the latest on the so-called Phoenix accused from almost a year ago? Uh, when I last spoke to you, uh, I think a lot of them have been released. Uh, unfortunately, one was assaulted in, in prison. Uh, these are people that, uh, by and large, we believe have been falsely accused of crimes. Uh, what's going on with them? Uh, how and, and, and what's the latest? I know that one person died from not receiving proper medical care while they were incarcerated. Any, any updates on the Phoenix accused? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Because as you rightfully say, uh, none of the mainstream media or any media is talking about them because uh, it's now been uh, basically uh, trying to cover it up as to what's really happening. So what has happened is I have in the meantime been in touch with uh, the lead investigator. Uh, so the Correctional Facility Service has its own investigation department. And I think for the past six months, I've been in contact with the guy when he started the investigation. Actually, when I met him, I was, you know, it's like the police investigating the police. You don't really expect. Like, inter anything. like internal affairs. Yeah. But I must tell you, I was very surprised to hear this investigator talking about doing things the right way, holding people accountable, getting to the bottom of. And in fact, I met him. He came over to my house. We had some meals. We shared stuff. And he called me a while ago to tell me that the official full report is ready. It's going to be presented before Parliament. The families are going to get the report. And uh, that's all been happening in the background that people didn't know. And a lot of them have been released uh, on bail. In fact, the last bail hearing is a couple of months ago. The, they actually had to go to the High Court to get the bail um, authorized. And the High Court judge asked, why is this even at the High Court? Why wasn't this sorted out at the regional court? But we all know why. Uh, and I've been, as you know, one of the main proponents of the first people to talk about the fact that these are innocent under proven guilty. They must be given a fall to their rights. I'm not saying they're not guilty, but we've always said justice for the Phoenix accused. But I can tell you of the bet, 80% of those people that were arrested will walk free. 80 to 90% will walk free. The charges are trumped up. The charges were made up and people were arrested to appease the public to say we've done some work. But in actual fact, the state has set itself up to be um, sued, sued, uh, sued uh, for wrongful arrests. And I think uh, that's definitely on the cards. Well, you know, it's been my uh, supposition without any facts, but just uh, following events as unfolded when the mainstream media was not covering the events of 9 through 16 July last year. They didn't jump on board till about the 13th, about the time that Ramaphosa probably told him it was okay to start reporting on it seriously. I will I will make uh, one exception there. He, um, 
News Africa was on the ground early on in the riots and the uh, the insurrection took place in KZN. And um, I, I won't say their coverage was balanced, but it was certainly um, pervasive. They were all over the place reporting on things taking place. And so I appreciate that. But, you know, SABC and all these other outlets, ENCA, they were very difficult to find reporting this. But what we could see unfolding was a lot of misreporting, a lot of fairy tales, a lot of fiction, and also a lot of racism being directed against the Indian community in particular, but also towards the minority white community, but the the, the especially the, the hatred that was uh, spewed against the Indian community was quite, I don't want to say surprising because I know it's there, uh, but it was still shocking to see it so publicly uh, out in the open for people to see. Well, I think there's two sides to that. When you say out in the open that it's there, um, you know, the media will, 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 will perpetuate or try to push the story across. Because mm -hmm. right now in the media, you'd find lots of stories about foreigners illegal uh, outfits, uh, robberies, whatever, because there's a push towards moving the uh, illegal immigrants out of our country. So naturally, the media is going to tell us, look, these guys are the problems in our country. They mm -hmm. are doing drugs. They are doing trafficking. Because right now, you have to focus on the illegal immigrants or undocumented immigrants to get them out of the country to suit the government agenda, which they can't do. Uh, you know, what's important, and I think I mentioned it last time to you, is that Prior to July 12th and then post July 16th, not one racial incident. Yeah. We're coming up from July 16th up to the day we talk. There's not one single racial incident in Phoenix, in Chatsworth, or any other area where the Indian community and black community live side by side. There's normal tension as in criminals and this yeah, sure. always happen. Sure. But Racial tension that it was it was a government agenda, it was a media agenda that said this was there. But in reality, how do you go from 12, 13, 14, uh, race-based, and on the 16, black people and Indian people are shopping together at the local mall? How, yeah. how is that even possible? Well, no, to be clear, to be clear, uh, Carl, uh, to be very clear about this, uh, just so my audience doesn't misunderstand, I wasn't making any allegations or claiming that any black South Africans were racist toward Indians. I mean, but they're racist in every group. My point was the media and the government narrative. That's yes. the racist agenda. That which you just, so. you just, you agree with me. But I just want to make it clear that everyone understands that that's what I'm talking about. There's an agenda here by the government. It's called race hustling. It's race baiting, decided to divide and conquer people so they can continue to rule. Because they sure, certainly aren't doing it on their governance. I mean, <laughs> look at the response to the floods. And they ignored the weather reports. They didn't clean drains for years. What a mess. And no emergency services. They deployed the army down there with no no water buffaloes. They couldn't even provide water for themselves. And you know, we see people dropping off water supplies at the, the premier's house, you know, or the mayor's house, not not taking care of people in need. So the ANC certainly um, doesn't deserve to govern based on their performance of governance. And so they get away with it with race hustling and race baiting, which is what I was getting at. Okay, Sean, I, I, you have a firm handle on things, so to speak. So I, I, I see that you, you're quite put up with it, as we know. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I just want to make sure the audience, because sometimes, you know, people will, will uh, infer incorrectly. But yeah, so no, but I mean, it's the, the race hustling is just endless. You know, it never ends in the media. It never ends with the government. OK, so the, the Phoenix accused, almost all of them are out on bail now, but they still are facing uh, criminal proceedings, uh, trials. As you say, most will likely be acquitted of charges because they appear to be trumped up. And so, you know, that puts their lives in hold, in a holding pattern, a cloud over them. And I mean, I don't know. They probably can't even travel abroad if, if they want to go visit family somewhere or go on vacation. I don't know the status of that, but but when you're charged with a crime, you've got to deal with that. Otherwise, the state worries about you absconding. And now their lives have been put on hold for an entire year. It was July 9th last year when this nonsense started. And here it is just a couple of days away from that, two weeks away, and it'll be a year anniversary. In fact, I'll probably do a broadcast on July 9th to uh, talk about the one-year anniversary of uh, what happened there. But their lives have been put on hold. That hardly seems fair. That's not exactly um, quick justice. Here in America, we're guaranteed, um, you know, quick justice, you know, for the, not, not the, the State can't take you to trial if you're not ready, but you can demand a, a jury trial and you can have it quickly here. Otherwise, people can be held into perpetuity, kind of like we do in Guantanamo Bay. Shh, don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it is. What, that's, look, I'm, I'm currently in a situation, I've been in court now for over a year. Um, and unfortunately, when you're in the system, you've got you to gotta, you gotta run with the system. Yeah. It's pretty slow. Um, all I can say is I have to bite the bullet and, and run with it. So, yes, I've also been, um, what shall I say, trumped up charges. 
Yep. But, but anyone can lay a charge. Anyone can do something. And once you're in the system, you can't get out of the system. You gotta you gotta run with the system. Yeah. So you're almost in a situation where you've been charged. Now you've got to go prove yourself innocent. And to get your day in court, there's adjournments upon adjournments, dockets, documents, this and that, all the other. You can't really do much about, it, especially here in South Africa. It just it just turns pretty slowly. I mean, I've been complaining left, right, and centre, but really not not much is happening. But having said that. Today, yeah, Friday and today were some of my better days in court. By the way, I can just tell you this much. I'm now uh, representing myself in a civil matter and a criminal matter uh, because the state of attorneys or lawyers, you, you hire an attorney, you think you're getting somebody who is smart in the law. Hell, I've learned a hell of a lesson, a couple of lessons uh, recently. But coming back to the Phoenix accused, you're right. I don't think their lives will ever be the same for them and their families, uh, really. Uh, what they've been through. I mean, I've never spent one day in prison. I can't even imagine going down to a cell after a couple of hours even. That, I mean, I admitted on a video recently that just being in court just shook me, you know, to be in a space that I'm not comfortable with. And these were ordinary citizens placed in jail, denied food, denied their rights. One passed away. One young man was raped in his first couple of weeks in prison. I, I can't imagine what they went through, what their families went through, uh, and their lives have been forever changed. How they go on with life now, obviously, as I said, hangs in the balance. Those who can't get work, those who were working, lost their jobs. How do they get work now? Like if somebody goes to work for a company and they're a Phoenix accused, they could bring untold problems to the company because you are now housing somebody being accused of helping somebody who was an accused who killed somebody. All of it is just allegations. It just follows you. It just, like even me, I am in court. I'm in criminal court because of an accusation. But the fact remains... I'm in criminal court, and that follows you as you are an accused in a criminal matter until the day you prove yourself innocent and then come out of it. So until then, I'm in criminal court, and that will follow me in that sense. But even then, even then, you can't escape that, particularly in an environment like the United States or South Africa. Let me give you a perfect case of this. Uh, Graham, what's his name? The uh, former captain of the uh, Proteas cricket team and then the uh, the guy that runs the club. When he hired a white coach instead of a black coach, they laid charges against him of racism, you know, hiring because of the race. And that was in the media, in the press every single day that South Africa cricket is racist, run by a bunch of right-wing racist, racist, racist. And that's been his name in the press for the last several years, only to find out that a black and Indian uh, judge reviewed the case and found no basis whatsoever, and he's been exonerated. But every newspaper, every Lexus Nexus search, everything you look for for the past three years says this man is a racist, convicted in the popular press, and that will follow him around forever, even though he never did it. It's like Eben Etzebeth. Now, that seems to have died away, but remember before the Rugby World Cup, just before they went to Japan, there was an altercation in a bar in, uh, I think it was the Western yeah, Cape yeah. or the Northern Cape, and uh, Eben Etzebeth was accused of being a racist because a colored gentleman who was three sheets of the wind pissed started a fight, and he walked away from it. The guy came back, and and then the guy accused him of racism. So we see the South African Human Rights Commission, which is really just a South African racist commission, open a case against him. And and, and so his reputation is forever um, impacted by that. Now, the good news for Evan Etzebeth is that seems to have died away and it's not something sticking with him. But the former captain of the cricket team, that's stuck with him forever. He never did those things. That that's 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 just a lie. And so your, your point is valid. When you're exonerated, when you're proven correct, that's great. But the people who cause your reputational damage get away with it just by making a fraudulent accusation. And almost none of them are ever, ever, ever prosecuted for their crime. Yeah, unfortunately, that, that is the reality of the situation, even where I am. The damage, the damage is already done. A lot of damage is done by that, and it will, it will forever follow you. Uh, even if you go somewhere or you're at an event, someone will ask you the question, look, hey, what happened with that? Now you've got to explain yourself in that scenario. So, yeah. I don't think it'll ever go away, um, and the damage is already done. Absolutely. So you just brought your mobile phone in a little bit closer. Was that so you get a better camera angle? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm live streaming on my page, you on my, on my other ah, page. Oh, you're stealing my content. Hey, YouTube, where's your copyright claim? <laughs> no wonder nobody's coming over here. They're all watching me on your channel. <laughs> hey, but seriously... All right, so so you're going to do a comedy uh, tour. That's that's good. Look, don't step away from that, man. You're kind of funny, you know. I mean, you know, you got a funny name there too. No, look, Cara, I, I, I use it. I use it to to still make sure that I'm relevant. And yeah, sometimes through comedy, you you reach a certain audience. Like I was at an interfaith meeting, and, and guys were saying to me that I'm going to move away from this and not do that. And I said to them, listen, 
in many ways you reach an audience in this way i reach an audience in that way i it's about how i can reach as many people as possible so yeah comedy and entertainment is still my game as much as i do the other stuff so people are battling to f- figure me out am i a serious guy or am i a funny guy w- which one am i but i'm at the moment i'm playing all the fields as best i can no it makes a lot of sense uh, you know i uh, i really appreciate the good comedians because good comedians are really tapped in to culture they really get uh, what's going on in society and, and, and how to make light of it and make fun of it. And that's really awesome. And I especially like that when it's a cross-cultural you know, sort of thing. When people, um, There's a really good book, a uh, little small book that came out several years ago. I bought one. I was in South Africa. It's called The Racist Guide to South Africa. It's hilarious. And the author talks about all the different ethnic groups, breaks it down by Afrikaner women and Indian men and black men and, and Zulu men. Anyway, and it's really funny taking all the cultural stereotypes and just kind of exposing them. And of course... Anyone reading the book who's a cogent, reasonable, lucid person is not going to be a racist or, you know, they're just going to, you know, find humor in the differences in how people perceive them. And that's what I like about comedy because it can really bring people together even when you're, you're making jokes about people, as long as they're not malicious jokes. Yeah, I'm not sure. It, it, it's another platform to reach an audience. So I'm still working a lot on that and I'm, and I'm making sure. Even I wasn't too keen on being TikTok videos, but I realized there's a, heavy, there's a lot, there's a big market on TikTok. There is. So I'm now lot more to reach to reach an audience who wouldn't watch me on Facebook or wouldn't watch me on that platform, but I can reach them there. So it's about reaching that audience. No, I agree with you. And in fact, um, Ronaldo Jos went to TikTok and said it was a great platform. And of course, I know what TikTok really does because I worked in the intelligence community. Uh, so I was reticent through it. And finally, in the end, I created a TikTok account just to reach more people because people get attached to platforms. And some people are just, you know, I mean, you know, the old Tannies are still stuck on Facebook. They'll never leave it. <laughs> okay, there, that was a joke. Uh, and then, uh, probably not a good one. And then, you know, it's uh, you've got the 15 year olds that are on TikTok and you've got uh, other people on this platform, that pl- platform. But some people really get married to a platform there's a lot of people that are only on instagram or only on tiktok or only on facebook yes, yes, sure. so so you really almost have to be on a lot of these platforms and your approach is different what i do on tiktok is very different than what i do on uh on uh on youtube for instance i have got one where i'm wearing a um a, a heavy metal rockers bleach blonde wig and i i do a song there it's you know joe biden's brain is on vacation far away when he speaks it makes you wonder Anyway, so that's uh, so TikTok's a little bit different. Yeah, but, but it's, it's important that if you they, the content is different, obviously, because maybe more entertaining quality. Mm. But they get to know your name, they get to know who you are, and they exactly. start to follow you. When you put another video of something else, they almost it come up on their page, so you they almost forced to watch it uh, in a way they get to know something else which they never would have had been privy to in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. I hundred percent on that. Yeah. So, so um, speaking of social media and different platforms and such, as we're coming up, oh gosh, we're, it seems like we've been talking for like an hour and a half. We only been talking for twenty minutes. That's pretty cool. So, let me just talk about this. I was told recently that um, your Facebook page was blown up. Your business Facebook page was taken away by Facebook. Can you tell me what happened without me losing my channel on YouTube? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 nothing about. Look, that happened. I've got you know from the last time I've got a. <laughs> I, when the movie comes out, everyone's going to go, wow. For now, when I talk about it, um, it's going to sound way out, like I'm probably making the story up. Uh, <laughs> but I honestly believe I'm a, in a very unique situation that I have a dedicated group of haters who went out of their way to um, to sort of bring me down and destroy me. Uh, it's been happening for over a year. It's a year and a half now, or whatever. And uh, so, you know, with Facebook, you'd get violations, right? Yeah. If you post a picture or whatever, you get a violation. So I got a violation one, violation two. Can you now? Facebook became like a, a little sixteen-year-old, you know, like you uh, virgin or something. If I use that word, that one small thing suddenly becomes a violation. Like I remember posting a picture about undress, and they flagged it for uh, promoting undress. <laughs> then I posted a picture of an Indian mother washing a child on a lap, and the baby's bottom was showing, and they put, and they flagged that for nudity. <laughs> but you know for yourself, Facebook doesn't just flag unless there are people who who, who uh, complain about it. Who will, who, right. Who, 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 yeah. We're right. reporting. People reporting you. Report the post. Yeah. So what has happened is my group of dedicators are so dedicated. Well, that group, one or two people in particular. So it's like your YouTube channel had a couple of violations, right? Hmm. Let's just say that uh, yeah. Facebook. They started going back in time, like five years, six years, eight years, ten years. Yep. Finding posts there that were 
sort of in violation and started reporting those. So what happened? Facebook started to just add all of them up, ticked all the boxes, and boom, they, they removed the page. Yeah, yeah. Now that's, so, that's what they do. That's what they do. So, but can you imagine someone like me, if I, if I go back a couple of months, it's so much of content, I, I get tired. But yes, somebody's sitting and scrolling through years of stuff to find it. That's the amount of dedication. I'm going to tell you right now, I cannot, I don't think there's any other person in this country that has the group of people or groups that are hating me. One person is a confirmed psychopath. I believe, I honestly believe that when I'm done with my uh, stuff, I can, I can talk a bit more about it. Yeah. But uh, my life is truly unique in that sense. And it's also a sad part, I must admit and say this, it's also a sad part for my community because, you know, uh, Chris, a lot of time people ask me because of my political activism, what do the black people say to you? What does Julius Malema say? Do they contact you? Are they after you? Do they try to attack you? And I say to them, you know what, in all my years of attacking either Julius Malema, the EFF, the ANC, whatever, the biggest hassle I've had, the biggest problems I've had are my own people. Ah. Nobody from the outside, nobody from there, it was my own people. Yeah. And look, my, my, and you know, my, my, my main page was so, thankfully I have other pages that I work on, right? Yeah. I uh, once got 22,000, once got 8,000, whatever. So I managed to manage to reach and I got a massive WhatsApp database and my TikTok is growing. So I'm still managing to reach a lot of people Good. and I'm working on my new platform. What that did for someone who wanted to bring me down for personal reasons, you know, I've done so much of great work for the community, for helping others. And suddenly now you lose that ability to do that. Yeah. Uh, in many ways. And it's hurt so many people. But look, for selfish reasons, it's what they wanted to do. And uh, But, you know, they say when one door closes, another opens. So I've just been going wild on TikTok. I've just been using my other platforms. I've just been doing that. And, and look, it's, it's allowed me to re restructure where I am. And we keep moving. We wake up and we keep moving. I think what they try to do is shut me down. But once again, they fail. They can't shut me down. In fact, right now, I think in my popularity here and what I've been doing, I'm actually at a, at a higher spot than where I was uh, six months ago. Well, it is interesting because, for instance, you know, uh, let me tell one story very quickly about Twitter, and then uh, I, I may have shared this with you before, but very quickly tell you what happened on my old channel, the one that was growing like gangbusters, you know, in four months went from two to 23,000 subscribers before they started trying to take me down. Uh, and by the way, not any time did I have a single community standard violation. They're all just trumped up nonsense, bogus. There was no truth to it. I refute it, and they just, you know, uh, 30 seconds later get a response after careful review. We've determined that your video does violate our standards. What careful review? It took 30 seconds for the damn email to arrive in your server for you to send me the note you'd already pre-decided and pre-judged. But, but yeah. uh, the, the libs of TikTok, which is a Twitter account. I'm not a big Twitter fan, but I've got an account there. Uh, but the libs of TikTok is one that just goes to TikTok and finds uh, videos from political leftists, demented lunatics, and then posts it on Twitter and they went after that account as a consequence uh, the the author of that account's popularity skyrocketed and now uh, I think has over a million subscribers after having just a couple hundred thousand because they went after it so sometimes it backfires on them but when they catch someone early on before they're known it can be successful in shutting down voices for instance my channel was shut down last year and I've had to struggle just to get back to where I'm at on this platform only yeah. 6,500 subscribers after having 23,000 it's taken over a year to get back to this point uh, it can be uh, very um, disheartening for people who are just trying to, you know, reach a community and make a difference, which is what I was trying to do. But, you know, I had uh, last year a video, I interviewed the CEO for the Restaurants Association, Wendy Alberts. So she's the, for the industry group for the restaurants. And they were trying to get the government to ease the restrictions before all the restaurants collapsed. And uh, I had her on for Valentine's Day last year before my channel was wiped out. And this is kind of indicative of what was going on. So she came on uh, February 14th. She spoke for about 14 minutes. And then I, she had to leave to go talk in front of the physical press in South Africa. And so I, I continued my broadcast for two and a half hours. That video, no complaints, no problems. Uh, and then um, after it was over the next day, I downloaded it. I edited out her interview and loaded it as a separate video, just the interview so people don't have to watch three hours. No problem for nine days. I bought new software, which was much better at editing. I could, and plus, my viewers had paid for a intro. The intro we used for the show, they bought that. They, they pulled money without my knowledge and had a professional intro made for me. It's really cool. It was very generous of them. And so I want to put that intro to in, you know open up for the video, and then I fix the audio levels. I loaded that video up, and that morning I was interviewing Gary Gold, USA rugby coach, and I was interviewing a member of the Democratic Alliance uh, from Parliament with an hour break between them. And so I was on YouTube interviewing Gary Gold, and all of a sudden... 
boom, I just got disconnected from YouTube. I'm like, is that, sure. yeah, yeah, I was right. 45 minutes in the interview, I just got disconnected. I'm checking my internet. I'm still talking to Gary in Zoom, so I have internet. And I went in my email. I had to apologize and excuse myself. He's a South African who coaches U.S. national side. And he agreed to come back and do it again later on. I went, uh, and of course, it was lost because that interview was never finished, so it wasn't saved on YouTube. So I... Um, I looked and I looked at my email and I had no message telling me why I was disconnected. I looked at my account, nothing. But then I found an email for the restaurant interview. I was accused of a child safe, safety policy violation. So very quickly, I went in, I appealed it and said, child safety policy violation. This is the industry leader for restaurants asking people to bring their partners out for Valentine's Day to patronize restaurants and be sure to tip your wait staff because they haven't worked for a year. Uh, just trying to save the restaurant industry. There's no children. There's no image of children, no discussion, no mention, nothing. It was a fraudulent claim. So I appealed it and quickly I had to scramble and download OBS because I use Streamlabs, but I wasn't paying at the time, so I can only use one account. So I had to download OBS, learn how to use OBS real quick, set it up, contact the member of parliament in South Africa, tell them, hey, I'm going to have to do this on Facebook. I've never done Facebook. Hopefully it'll work. And, and of course, now you've been falsely accused, so you feel like, oh man, like you're in trouble. You did something wrong. So I'm doing all that. I'm scrambling, trying to have a good interview. I appeal it. While I'm going through all that, I look at my mail, I have a response. Within 15 minutes, YouTube looked at my video to their credit and said, you know what? You're right. There's no policy violation here. We've restored your video. And sure enough, they did. So I did the interview the next hour. And then right after the interview was over, I went back online and I checked my mail. That same video was removed for child safety policy violation again. I wrote to them. I said, what, 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 you just said this wasn't. The video hasn't been edited. It's the same video. How can it now? And then they, three hours later, they restored it. Four times in 24 hours, that video was removed for the same bullshit, bogus, fraudulent child safety policy violation. You know why? Because demented, self-pleasuring, leftist, hate-wanking fools went on there and all pushed the button and said, this, and they all teamed up and said, this is child safety. They got a bunch of reports without even looking at the video. They just attacked the creator. They took it down. Caro, that happened to me on four videos over the span of, actually five videos over the span of four days. I wasted about a dozen hours refuting fraudulent claims, and that's when I knew the handwriting was in the wall. They are attacking my videos that don't violate any policy violations and then handing out strikes on things that did not violate community standards when they were produced a year prior. And now they came up with bullshit community standards and claim that this violates it. Like you, am I supposed to go back and look at my 1,500, 2,000 videos and go, oh, we have new rules this week. Let me see which of my videos it would take me yeah, weeks. To, it would yeah, take me weeks yeah. to do that. There ought to be grandfathering in there. But it's all about the fact that YouTube is here to make tons of money for Google and to push a political narrative. And if you fall astray of that narrative, you are grist for the mill. But I think I think what you're saying is people need to understand that when you stand up like what you're doing, what you speak for, there are people who are dedicated to bringing it. It's not a part-time job. It's a full-time job trolling you and trying to bring you down. It's a no, and, so, and some of them actually get paid by leftist groups who, who fund their activities. And, I, and my wife has been telling me that some of my detractors, she thinks they are being paid by certain because it takes a lot of effort to do what they're doing. But anyway, let's not focus on the negative. We yeah. are still here. We yeah. are positive and we keep walking. We keep moving. So I have a question for you. You know, I have this program called Answer the Question with Rob Hutchison from DRSA. We do, we're supposed to do it every week. We don't do it every week. But anyway, so on the program, uh, people can come in and ask questions. So it's up to Rob and I. We're called the Wise Bros. <laughs> it's up to us to answer the question. So, uh, Caro Charo, I'm going to ask you to answer the question. Do you keep U.S. dollars safely stored in your furniture? I'm just curious. <laughs> Um, look, I'm, I'm, we, we don't have any U.S. dollars, but I'm Indian. We keep gold. And, uh, yes, we have um, furniture is important to us. Um, and, you know, I was a bit disappointed in, uh, in Sonal because he didn't take the necessary precautions. And I, I even called him up to say, listen, if you want to hide stuff in your furniture, please contact us because we know how to do it. We know how to get it done. And uh, he just he just missed the boat, you know. He, he, he didn't know how to do it. It's disappointing in a way that I think he could have got away with it, but he, he didn't. He didn't take the necessary precautions. But look, <laughs> I'm Indian. We 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 mastered the art of mattresses and, and and stuff and furniture. So if he wants to know, fine. But look, if what you're asking me, if you're gonna send me some some dollars to to put away for you, I'm okay with that. I can I can I can store those dollars. <laughs> 
Well, that's important, you know, because I, I did a, 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 a video um, right after the, uh, the Palo Palo thing came out. And um, I see that other people have run with my idea now. They may have come to it independently, but I did a, I did a whole series of videos about the uh, CEO of the uh, Ramaphosa Palapala Savings Bank, Cornelius Funder Laundering, and um, how he was uh, refuting stories and then, then adds, you know, inviting you to bring your money to the Palapala Savings Bank. And then, of course, uh, Cornelius was on the run. He was a person of interest and Saps was looking for him. Last spotted somewhere. He claimed to be in Northern Cape, but it looked a lot more like... I don't know, somewhere near the Botswana border, near, near. <laughs> anyway, well, but I don't, I don't know if you ever heard today. I just saw a news clip because I was out the whole day. Uh, Arthur Fraser is now being charged with corruption. Of course, of course. I mean, look, the, the ANC is imploding. They're just eating themselves alive. And and I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it because it's long overdue. This is a, re- a racketeering organization. The corrupt, I mean, they look, they, they're making ZANU-PF look like rookies. You know, they're really making Zimbabwe look like, wow, those guys didn't know what they're doing. We're perfecting this. This is, I mean, look, the rot starts at the head with the fish. I mean, and I said that all along. When the Ramaphoria took place in December of 2017, like, are you people smoking crack? You do know who this guy is. I don't know why you're calling him a business genius. He has no business acumen. You hand me $450 million in 1994, and guess what I have today? $10 billion, not $450 million, which is what Cyril has. He hasn't made any money. <laughs> How do you do that? You, you almost can't help but make money with assets accruing in value over that time. Anyway, no, Ramaphoria was just a scam, and those who fell for it deserve what they got. But let, let, let me ask you a question. Sure. Chris. Uh, right now... The, and, I, and, I, and I raised this in one of my videos, uh, the EFF, the DA, all calling uh, for the removal of Cyril Ramaphosa. Yeah. My question is, if not Cyril, then who? Where, well, where, where do we stand as a people if tomorrow Cyril Ramaphosa is removed from government? Where does that leave us as South Africa? Are we in a better place or are we in a worse off place? Well, it's a fair it's a fair question, and a lot of people have always um, made uh, made a big deal about that, uh, saying that you know if we get rid of him, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? But quite frankly, the ANC does have what I would consider to be legitimate politicians, and you know they just need to trot them out. I mean, if, if I had an option, I mean, since your president isn't chosen by voters, it's chosen by the parliament. Um, if I had an option, then uh, Trevor Manuel would be a member of parliament, and uh, I would pick him to be president, at least uh, by all no, accounts. But, but, as, but as you know, our yeah. system works, party leader becomes president. Right. So, well, then, so you just, if the ANC is serious, they should, they should pick one of the few people who are honest and has the gravitas to actually be leader of their party and that president. But they're not. The problem is the party is, is going to break apart. The radical economic transformation has people who are brainwashed, who believe false narratives about history and blame other people for their failures. And especially you have that group inside the RET. You also have inside the radical economic transformation, a group of people who don't care about history, who want to use history, and they want their fingers on the spoils. They like the patronage system. They want to get their hands on tenders. That's, you know, so you have, a, you have interests that are inimical to good governance and democracy. And then you have some people in the ANC that are actually looking for that. And it's, it's, it's you have some people in the ANC that just want to get even for, for apartheid. And so the party is fracturing. We've already seen COPE broke away several years ago. Then we saw the EFF, which is really just the ANC youth wing that left and, and some malcontents. And the party is going to split again, maybe before the 2023 election or 2024 elections. We'll see. But the ANC is, the ANC, the organization was founded just after the beginning of the 20th century is a disgrace to that origin. So Plachi and what the what the party represented, the organization back in those days, this is not that party. This is just a, a lying, racketeering, history-stealing, history-altering bunch of clowns who are disgraced to the liberation struggle, to the Black Sash movement, to Steve Biko's Black Consciousness movement, to uh, the Liberal Party, to the Pan-African Congress, commies I don't like, but at least they were fighting for liberation, to all the groups who fought to end apartheid and bring one man, one vote, Obviously, I mean women too, and transgenders. In case you're missing out, folks, but uh, yeah, they can vote too. But um, they're a disgrace, they're an absolute disgrace, and um, they need to be gone as quickly as possible. Uh, but if not Cyril, who? Well, not the ANC. That's what I say. Yeah. So I find, you know, we find ourselves in this unique situation as to yeah, yeah. We know those things are happening, but who do we? I mean, deputy president is David Mabuza. I mean, David Mabuza is. Neither yet nor there. He's been, he's been, he's been, he's been gone. Nobody knows who's he. He's, he's been in he's Russia. Been he's been in Russia yeah, coordinating so, the offense against you know, Ukraine. <laughs> how, how, how does it? How does it leave us as a people? I have to ask myself. You know, where do we stand? And then I've got people who are 
close associate with Jacob Zuma and his clan, and they give me a story that now they're going to be better off than Cyril. He knows more. They've done. And I said to my, I said, what do you want me as a, as a, as the public to know or to understand when I hear all of this and I hear all of that? How do you want me to to say yes? Jacob Zuma will be better. He's better off because I've had a lot of argument about Jacob Zuma being better than Cyril Ramaphosa. That he was. He was the one calling out situations. They didn't want him. But there's an argument for him. But, you know, then I read a tweet from uh, his daughter. Says, uh, I smell another unrest. You know, when, when, when they tweet things that I wonder, how do you want me to take you seriously when you, when, when, you, when you do things like that? Even if I wanted to take you seriously. So, we are in a, in a, in a bit of a doldrum. And the next couple of weeks and months, uh, but come 2024... I think it's going to be a game changer for us here in South Africa. Well, yeah, if you can survive to 2024. Look, I tried to tell South Africans, quite frankly, that the answer wasn't 2024 back in 2020. I told South Africans the answer is 2021. The municipal elections are what matter. The next two years are critical for South Africa. And this is the time to unseat the ANC either directly through a, a, an opposition party winning a municipality or through a coalition, although I don't prefer coalitions because they're fractious. At the municipal level, national level is a different story, but at the municipal level, you need an outright majority so that you don't have to be beholden into a minority party to give them favors to do things they want to do because in South yeah. Africa let's be honest there's too many crooked politicians who want favor and want contracts and want privilege and position not to serve the people so what should have happened is that we should have seen 45% of eligible voters show up at the polls, but instead 31% show up at the polls in a typical abysmal municipal uh, election. And on top of that, you know, the DA is running around crowing about, well, the ANC has been brought below 50%. Yeah, they got 13% of the eligible voters. And the DA looks at me like a deer in the headlights or a springbok in headlights going, huh? Yeah, you have to count the number of people eligible to vote, not the number of people actually showed up, the 11 million. They got 13% of the people in the country who could vote for them did vote for them. They shed so many votes, it's not funny. But you know what? They're not alone. They lost 31% of their vote from 2016 to 2021. But then these parties try to mislead people. They look at 2019. 2019 has no bearing whatsoever on 2021. It's a national election. It doesn't go the same way. The number of people come out are much larger. The enthusiasm, the issues, people come out and vote in national elections because they think it's of much more importance. But the reality is municipal elections is what matter. And this is where you have to fix it. You have to fix things at the municipal level. You have to give service delivery because the government controls so much of the civil sector. It controls water. It controls roads. It controls highways. It controls police. All those things, rubbish removal, all that controlled by the government. Whereas here in the States, most of that's covered by the private sector. So you don't turn to the government to remove your trash. You don't turn to the government for your water. You don't turn to the government for anything except policing. So in South Africa, you have to deliver services, and then you can change people's minds by showing that, hey, look, the UDM, the, the IFP, the DA, the Freedom Front Plus, the Action SA, they can actually govern. They're the ones who fixed the potholes. They're the ones that made the water run. They're the ones that made it safe and secure in our homes. That's what you do. But no, South Africans did their typical thing. They whinge, they complain, they, they whined about it. They didn't do anything. They didn't go to the polls. And the ANC continues to rule over 150 municipal areas with only 13% of the people voting for them. That's the reality you have in South Africa. And people need to get off their ass and get out there. And in 2024, the ANC is already below 50%. You still have the DA talking about bringing them below 50%. The ANC will be lucky to get 35% of the electorate to vote for them in 2024. There's my prediction today, and I'll stand by it, and I bet you I'm going to be 100% correct. And so we're going to hear the whole story about coalitions. But you've got to be careful because the EFF is just a charlatan. They will change on a dime to suit their needs. Right now, it's all anti-ANC because they smell blood. But after 2024, when they don't win any more than 15% of the electorate because that's their ceiling, after 2024, the EFF is going to have to take a hard look at where they're at, and they're probably going to team up with the ANC again. If the ANC gets gets 40% or gets 36%, the EFF, they could team up and get that 50%. So people need to go to the polls and vote for anybody, anybody except the EFF and the ANC. And then your future can be assured and you can return to the rule of law. Thankfully, in this country, we're going to see a tsunami in November and the events are going to be changed around here. In the meantime, the Supreme Court is upholding the Constitution on a daily basis, the right to keep and bear firearms, uh, the religious persecution of uh, religious people in this country has been struck down twice this week, including again today. A Supreme Court decision struck down in a 6-3 to three decision that was unconstitutional to deny a high school football coach to go on the field and pray with his athletes after the game. The demonic leftists said that that was interference of church and state. 
state. It's not. And their argument was he's an agent of the state. He's not an agent of the state. He's a coach of the players. If the players are allowed to go out there and pray after a game, they're wearing the uniform of the school. Why can't the coach go out there too? That's a suppression of his First Amendment rights, freedom of speech, and freedom of religion. And that was overturned today. They'll have to give him his job back from years ago. Anyway, that was a long soliloquy, but I thought it was necessary. I'll take a breath now. It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, where was that starter? Which part of the starter? Uh, I don't know. The, yeah, the ANC and uh, its shenanigans. Um, we just have to wait and uh, see and play and play it out. Uh, I don't. I, uh, EFF. But you're right. You're, you, the main thing you're on spot on about is what I've been pushing now and will continue to push is that people need to go out firstly register to vote. Some guys, a lot of them even register to vote and then actually go out and vote. They need to know that their vote counts. Um, and yeah, so uh, I, I'm. I'm just pushing that agenda as well, wherever I can. When guys complain to me, I say, so what have you done? Are you part of a community activist group? Are you yep. part of a street patrol? Are you part of a WhatsApp group? Are you part of... No. I said, then, man, you're not an active citizen. If you're not an active citizen, don't complain. Yep. You got you. got If you want to complain and you expect your complaints to be taken seriously, you have to have skin in the game. Yeah. So yep. that, that, that... Well, yeah. That, that's putting it right, the right way. So uh, here's something I got to ask you um, for the audience because not everybody knows this. You've got something stenciled on your cap. A couple of your viewers, uh, VL Naidu is one of them, and someone else, L my five pence, also commented on it. What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you pronounce it? Is it upside down on your? Right? Oh uh, please! I, if I pronounce it, I pronounce it phonetically, and I'd say my dear. Not on bad. So the first letter is as in ma. As yeah. in your mother, ma. Yeah. And then der, der. Der. Okay. Okay. Ma der. Ma. Okay. Same. So say ma der. Ma der. Yeah. So there we go. So this is a this is an Indian slang, by the way. And on my shirt, you'll see it's got certified. I've got a stamp here. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So mother is a is an Indian slang, as, and actually a uniquely Durban or South African slang. Well, that was my next question. You say Indian, but Indian's a big subcontinent. It's an yeah, Indian, so South African, Indian. South okay. African, Indian slang. Like we say Indian because we're Indian. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. I got it. Now I know it's in a worldwide platform. It's South African, Indian. Uh, mother, <laughs> the word, um, actually, it's, it's how you use the word. Okay. The, so con example, the, con say, the context. And and in, in the, like, Chris White. And you're going to use the F word. Like, so that that means a bad way. Yeah. And then I'll say, Ah, Chris White, that guy, he's a mother. That's in a good way. Like he's he's the man, he's the dawn, he's the thing. It's it's all in the context. And this word in our own population took on a bad context, like almost a swear word. And in my last twelve years of the industry, I came across as this, and I started changing the like you know, in America the word nigger used to yeah, be very yeah. And then black people started using the word nigger. Yeah. They took the word and they turned it on its head. They owned it. it. Became the word. They owned it. They owned it. Yeah. They owned it. Yes. So I believe let's let's own the word. Let's own it. It's our word. Let's use it our way. So right now, this is my trademark and the certified mother. And, and people, when they see me anywhere, they say mother. I said, I said, let's use it our way. Um, so there's no real meaning of it, but mother in the in the good context, when I say Chris White is a mother, means he's a great guy, he's a top guy, he's the dog, he's the best at what he does. So yeah, that's that's the about the long and short explanation that I can give you of it. All right. Well, I mean, I have a global audience, and not everybody knows. So I, you know, I just thought it was in the chat. A couple people no, mentioned you're wearing yeah. it. So, no, you know, hey, listen. Um, I've long been. I don't know if you are. I, it, 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 I'm not going to make the assumption because you're Indian, but but I don't know if you are. But I've long been a fan of uh, Bollywood. Not everything coming out of Bollywood, but some movies are really, really awesome. But I just saw this incredible Bollywood movie. Uh, a couple weeks ago on Netflix before I canceled my membership on that ripoff uh, network, but uh, an incredible movie. Uh, and it was about a battle that took place at the end of the 19th century with um, Indians up in the, in the, in the, um, in the, in the Kashmir uh, region, apparently, you know, fighting a battle. And um, the Brits left this one outpost on defending. There were like 18 soldiers there and they defended against an army of thousands. And it was, it's incredible. I don't know if you know, I can't think of the name of that movie, but it was incredible. But um, it just reminded me of, you know, the contributions Bollywood brings to theater. I, some of the stuff I really, really enjoyed. You know, when I was in Liberia, uh, the movie theaters were all broken down because there's no power and the war and everything. So one theater reopened and all it had was like, you know, all, there were no windows because you needed ventilation because it was so hot and humid. And um, there's no power for fans, but they would project um, Bollywood movies up and people would come by the throngs just to watch a movie. They were so excited. So I saw a lot of Bollywood and this movie just uh, struck my mind. It was really good. I, don't know, I wish I knew the name of it. I mentioned it, but I don't know. Do you watch Bollywood at all? 
Well, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm, a, not that I'm not a fan. Just I need three hours of my life first to dedicate to watch a Bollywood movie. <laughs> but, well, then, I'm usually working when it's in the background, when the dance numbers come out and the women are half naked. That's when I come watch it. <laughs> what, I, what, I, what, I think, what I think Bollywood, so when people think Bollywood, they think extravagant outfits, singing and dancing. But yet you're talking about an Indian movie, not necessarily a Bollywood movie out of India, yeah. that's got a real story to it. That's right, right. So I, I, I now watch those type of movies because India, India, shall I say, Bollywood is producing just the song and dance kind of things. And now there's so much more movies about stories, about history, yeah. and those sort of things. Like, so like the one I'm referring to. Yeah, so I'm now drawn to those type of movies, not necessarily singing and dancing, although there are great movies like that as well. But those are just purely entertainment, you know. So yeah. I'm drawn to that. I'm drawn, I mean, even... Cinema has evolved to such an extent in India, whereas years back, a couple would just go so far, no kissing, no touching, and no whatever. And now they're full on sex, drinking, drugs, whatever. But actually what they're showing is the real Mumbai, yeah. what people really do, rather than trying to camouflage it, like, oh, we don't do that, and we don't do this. Uh, stories about girls, you know, how they treat it in the communities, marriages. The real India is coming out about what really goes on. And I mean, I'm interested in those sort of movies. And, and you see the real belly of, of India. I mean, I've never been to India. So yeah. I like to see those movies and, and learn a bit more uh, about how, how life really is there. No, as do I. There's another, as a fantastic, uh, I guess a mini series, uh, is a cop, an Indian cop, and he deals with the grit and the grime, the corruption, and, and all this stuff. It's incredibly well done. I wish I could think of the name of it. Uh, I saw that. Uh, uh, I think it was the Netflix, not 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 um, Amazon, but we're absolutely incredible. I mean, I I agree with you. That cinema is fantastic, but I do I do like a guilty pleasure now and then of the dancing and the and the three hours. You know, I play it in the background sort of thing. But but when I say Bollywood, for me, it's 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 Bollywood's not just what you just described. It's all of that. It's just Indian cinema. It's just like Hollywood yeah, is a description for American cinema and Nollywood for Nigerian cinema. But of the three, that would be the lowest quality tier. Would be the Nollywood, but it's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I love. Uh, I think India. By the way, you know for a fact the number of movies that put up a couple of calls, the number of movies that India can produce. Uh, um, yeah, it's astounding. One one Hollywood movie will take six months. I think they'll produce 10 Bollywood movies at the same time. Absolutely. And, and those are two and a half hour, three hour movies that are just, I think they, they just they just recycle, recycling stuff on, a, on an unbelievable level. But all good. Um, I'm surprised and, and pleasantly surprised the quality has, has improved, the storylines yeah. have improved and all of that, which is why people from around the world are attracted to Bollywood movies. Well, and, Bollywood stuff. and the cinematography has also made a tremendous leap forward. I mean, the quality of the video, the, 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 I for imagery that the people producing films, these serious films in India is really dramatic. I mean, the level has just gone up. I mean, you go back just 10, 15 years ago, very amateurish a lot of these things. But now, I mean, this is this is this is top quality stuff. And and the stories are compelling. The grit and the grime of what's happening in Mumbai and and the corruption and and the, the difficult life and stuff. That's that's fascinating stuff. Actually, actually, to be honest, on Netflix, I'm now more I gravitate towards the Indian movies because they have better storylines. They have. Yeah. Uh, more real stories. I've actually found myself when I'm battling to find something on Netflix. I gravitate towards an Indian movie. I say, "What's this about?" Yeah. Okay, there's something. Here's a good story. Let me watch that. And I find that to be more interesting than a lot of the series that are, are on Netflix. Yep. So there's a super chat here from Patrick. 14 rand. Thank you for the Patrick. Uh, that is the down payment for my Tesla. Appreciate that. 14 rand. <laughs> Uh, and Mr. B wants to know, uh, why is this guy wearing sunglasses indoors? Well, Mr. B, um, Karu Charu has a unique genetic um, affliction, and it forces him to wear sunglasses indoors. Otherwise, um, his eyes would mesmerize you and convince you of whatever he tells you. And um, in order to prevent a uh, raft of lawsuits, we forced him to wear sunglasses during this broadcast. <laughs> yeah, it's similar to the MIB uh, scenario. That's right, MIB. And, uh, yeah, so I've been... <laughs> I've been in court and I've had lawsuits. Many, look, many, many things look, have look. changed. Now yes, look, yeah. look right, look right here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's actually for your own protection, as uh, 
Chris has rightly said so. Just <laughs> that's right. right. We don't we, we don't want anybody you know super chatting you know fifteen hundred rand you know just at a whim on this channel. We couldn't have that. That's dangerous. Uh, so if if Caro uh, took off those glasses, you'd be compelled to send two thousand rand to this channel immediately with a super chat. Immediately. So, immediately yeah, yeah. So you know we we don't want your bank accounts to be in trouble. John Jarvis, uh, who complained that I was talking too much earlier, and uh, John, the door is right there. So uh, said uh, I, I've been to India four times. Confirmed that Bollywood does not reflect reality of what is actually happening. Uh, well, John, um, would you mean the Bollywood description we're talking about the dancing movies, which are just inner group? They're, yeah, so they're just, he's using Bollywood yeah, as you're right. He's that, using it in that, that fashion. Yeah, that not, fashion, yeah, not the fashion I'm talking about with the gritty, hard hitting, genuine, serious, you know, great cinematography films that are That's coming so using, out. That's using Bollywood as a, as, a, as a whole term for Indian yeah. movies. Yeah, yeah, for Indian movies. movies. Just just like I use Hollywood for American yeah. movies. But I mean, Hollywood's not the only place we make movies. We make movies in Vancouver, we make movies in North Carolina, and then on location. Uh, and then also we have studios that, uh, like the the um, the uh, Hallmark Channel does. Hallmark's like, like, like Bollywood, man. They crank out a movie in, in, in six days. It's a two and a half hour movie, yeah. six days, and they do that all year long. Uh, but Hollywood is the catch all term, and Nollywood is the catch all term, of course, for Nigerian cinema. Did, Which you, watch, did, you, did, did you catch a movie called Kashmir Files? Kashmir what? Kashmir Files. No, no. Is that a comedy or a serious it, one? No, no. It's a very serious movie. It's about, it's about you, know, the, you know, the whole history between Pakistan yeah. and India, and, and Kashmir is a disputed area. Right. So there was a, there's a historical fact, historical fact in inverted commas, depending on who's listening to it about how the pundits or the, the, the were, were assassinated in uh, in Kashmir. So the Kashmir files uh, starts to tell the real story. I'm going to put it in inverted commas as to what happened. But as you know, propaganda is whoever wants to tell the story, tell the story from their angle. So it's a, it's a, it's a pro from an India point of view, should I say, uh, obviously paints Pakistan as the uh, offending party, but uh, if it went down the way it went down, it's quite interesting. I use that word, but maybe something you need to try and catch up on. It uh, gives you an inside view of the Kashmir, uh, what really happened there. You know, like like so many wars around the world, things happen, so many atrocities. The real stories will never will will never be uh, will never be known. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, but film can bring that to people's attention. I mean, it really can draw it in, even if there is a bit of um, embellishment. And it. it's still nice to, to get people's. For instance, I was, I'd only tangentially heard about that battle that I was talking about in the film. I, I hadn't really paid much attention to it, but it's really so fascinating. I, I, actually, I actually forced my 16 year old son to sit in the cinema. Yeah. And a friend of mine. And, he, and look, he was highly bored because it's a slow moving movie. But at the end of the day, he knows about Kashmir, he knows about the situation. He knows what happened there. Even if he took in 40% of what is happening, I've given him some, some knowledge. That's why I forced him to sit there. And one of the important lessons he learned there about the media, there was a person in the same group of people who were fighting the battle and he was a journalist. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and, and I remember the guy in the movie saying, you need to tell our story. You know, the real story right. of what really happened. And when the shit hit the fan and whatever happened, the journalist was actually on the other side speaking against his own friends. <laughs> You know, and I said to my son at the end of the day, you know, it's a very important lesson to learn about journalism and the media and what story the media tells him. If he took anything away, he took that away from the movie as to how the story is told on the outside by somebody wanting to tell. Yet yeah, this guy was in the belly of the beast, but chose to tell a different version of the story. Absolutely. I think I found the name of it. Is this the one I'm looking for? Yeah, this is the one I'm looking for. The real story of Kasari. 21 Sikh soldiers fought 10,000 Afghan warriors the Battle of Saragari. Yeah, that's the one. The one you watched. The one you watched. Yeah, that was incredible. Yeah, the Battle of Saragari. The 21 Sikh soldiers from the 36 Sikh regiment fought 10,000 Pashtun tribesmen. <laughs> wow. Unbelievable. Oh, wow. Yeah, unbelievable. You must, you must send me the name of that. I'm trying to find it. Yeah, yeah, the movie's... Yeah. I forget the name of it, but I'll find... Oh, 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 it's called Kasari. That's the film. Kasari is the, uh, is the name of the film. K-E-S-A-R-I. I'll put this... Uh, in the um, actually, there's the link for. I'll copy the link so that the audience can find it. It's on Netflix. Now, look, it's it's a typical one of these things where there's you know, um, it's obviously some Hollywoodism or Bollywoodism, whatever you want to call it in there, and there's some stretch in reality. But it's a really well done, and you can't help but um, find yourself pulling for for these guys in the story. It's uh, you know, it's 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 really good. It shows uh, you got to watch it. I put the link in there, folks. Go check it out, and I'll send it. To, I, let me just send it to you now in WhatsApp so I don't forget. Okay. Yeah, WhatsApp can, it to me. yeah it's, I'm gonna WhatsApp it to you right now so you can check. It after this i play it but i'll get a copyright strike i'm sure so i don't want to do that but yeah that's incredible i just happen to catch that on uh and i mean look i anything that's uh conflict related i typically if it's a good movie i'll watch it and, and this one really really enjoyed it. it was fantastic so yeah there you go um and then what somebody just said here
here. Um, oh, I lost it there. Oh, Fish just says, how does Chris also know about Hallmark movies? My holiday only favorite channel. Well, I know about a lot of things there, Fish is, um, you know, uh, and also know that a lot of the lead actors in Hallmark movies are homosexual. Yet apparently Tom Hanks thinks that straight people can't play gay roles, but apparently gay people can play all straight roles at their whim. So anyway, just saying. <laughs> Because when are you are you coming to South are you coming to CRCA in South Africa if you still around? Yeah, yeah, no, I, well, yeah, I'm going to be there in August and September. Um, I haven't set my agenda and itinerary because um, security concerns. I'm, I'm being, just being cautious. But my flight's already booked. I, I got a incredibly good deal. <laughs> of course, we'll see if flights are canceled or delayed, how good a deal it is. But yeah. but unfortunately, it's not direct because I'm, I'm not Bill Gates and people don't super chat enough on my channel. So um, I had to get the best price I could and I, I bought it early. And so I got a good round trip ticket. But I have to go from Harrisburg to Chicago to Frankfurt to Cape Town. And then in reverse order, 34 hours each way with about eight hour layovers in Frankfurt, <laughs> you know, and four yeah, hours in Chicago. Hours, yeah. yeah, well, that's it's it, it is what it is. But um, uh, it'll be fine. The good news is that I get two bags. So I'll bring I can bring some of my merch, which people have been desperate for and they can't buy in South Africa. So I'll just hand out some of my merch when I'm down there. I'm hoping to grow my audience. Um, my plan is is to meet with. Previous guests on my program, like yourself, do a meet and greets. I don't know if you know that, but on my channel, um, I started now that I'm traveling abroad again after this COVID hysteria has d died down. I was in the UK in May, and I started meet and greets. I went to um, to Coventry and met with uh, Keith Alderson. We, we did a chat in a pub. Then uh, I went to Oxford with Fleshin. We did, it, we did another chat there in a pub. And then I went to Bournemouth where I met up with Hendo. And um, then oh, Hendo, yeah. Yeah, Hendo came to London and joined me on the Monday after the rugby. I met with Lord Duncan McNair, a for, former member of the House of Lords and a guest on my program, Humanitarian Rights Guy. And uh, we met for meet and greet there. We didn't broadcast that one, though. But uh, anyway, so when I come to South Africa, a lot of what I'm – it's not going to be a vacation for me in any way. <laughs> it's going to be all about getting content yeah, well, out look, there. So yeah. you, you obviously uh, – I would say you know something more, more about South African politics than I do, and I'll say that quite openly because you, you, you're quite educated in that sense. But when you come here, obviously, we like to take you on the ground, show you what, how, how we live side by side, to have an idea yeah. of what, what the situation really is on the ground, which, as you know, mainstream media doesn't tell you the story about what happens and what goes down. Absolutely. You know, you know Chris, when I, I, addressed, I didn't get to address the Human Rights Commission because they gave me an appointment and then they canceled my appointment. I think they knew I was going to talk too much of nonsense and didn't like, so they cut me off the Human Rights Commission. <laughs> But the previous two weeks, I addressed the CRL Commission, uh, Community Rights, Linguistic, uh, Religion, Linguistic Rights. And I went there and I said, listen, I'm going to address this committee on my way, on my standards, where I talk. And you know, at that point, I don't know if I told you this example before. When the guys were being stopped during the unrest uh, and they would stop black guys in a bucket, two black guys in the front, two in the back, and they stopped the guy. And it came across as racial profiling. Yeah, because you're stopping, you're stopping a black guy, right? right. So you so there's a big whoa of racial profile. So when I address this committee, there were about six uh, uh, advocates there. Five were black, one was a white guy, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'm going to use this example for you. I said, you live in a middle class area, and your neighboring area is a low income area, and I used Mexicans for whatever reason, as as another population, and I said. The crime in your area is committed, 80% of the crime in your area is committed by the Mexicans. They mm -hmm. said, they understood? Okay, right. I said, you on a street patrol at night, half past 10 at night, in a street patrol, and you see a bucky in the middle of your suburb, two Mexicans in the front and two Mexicans in the back, would you stop the vehicle? They said, yes. I said, then you're racially profiled. Yep. I said, you're doing exactly what you are accusing others of doing, but you would do it yourself. You see... When you change the dynamic of from black to Mexican, suddenly it takes on a whole new ball game. But you see, in South Africa, because the population is majority black, and it becomes racist. Like, I'll use the example. That's why I've, I've been called a racist myself, because I call it out for what it is. Yep. And I said, you're going to see the difference. For example, an employer who's abusing an employee, it's just that 90% of the time it's a black guy, because blacks make up the, the majority of the people of the workforce. Right. But he's an employer who's employed who's abusing an employee. It could be a Mexican, it could be a Chinese, right. he'd do the same thing. He's not, he's not being racist, he's just a bad employer right. who's got no way of dealing with it and wants to pay the least amount of money, get the most amount of work out of this guy. It's just that in South Africa, he's a black guy. 
Yeah, I know, and it goes that way with everything. It's the same thing about, you know, women don't have this, women don't make the same pay, equal pay as men. That's nonsense. You know, uh, if you work for a law firm and at the age of 32, you're in the same par and headed for the same position, headed for a partner position with the firm, and you make the conscious choice to take a hiatus from work for three years to have a child and to raise that child, uh, and then you come back. Meantime, your, your, your colleague has been bringing millions of dollars of revenue to the firm and has brought in more clients and has won several big cases as a bigger reputation is the is the lawyer that they want to go to when they hire and you come back and then you demand to have the same pay that's not fair and it's also not unfair to you that you don't get the same pay you weren't there and oh, that's just the nature of, of, of biology and, and that's what's unfair is biology if you don't like that then rant to God or rant to heaven or Allah whoever made you the way you are but don't blame a system because you are entitled to something that you didn't earn and that's something that's lost on people you know in the US government I'm so sick of hearing people in the government complain about women don't have the same pay that's nonsense I served in the army the pay scales are not determined by gender they're determined by rank and longevity so if you're a colonel with 26 years, you make the same amount of money, whether you're black, brown, blue, yellow, green, male, female, transgender, you make the exact same pay. This is nonsense. Um, and I'm so sick of it, but it's the same thing. If you are in a urban center in New York and it's late at night, most of the streetlights are burned out, there's one light on, you see a group of youth across the street with their trousers hanging down and the crack of their ass exposed and they're standing in a semicircle and you walk intentionally three streets around to cross to get away from them, does that make you a racist? Well, if it's a white person, yeah, you're a racist. But when the black youth do the same thing, they're not told, well, they're just prudent. They're making a good decision. Um, you know, that's the bottom line. Everyone does it. Um, there's this whole thing called implicit bias. Uh, Harvard has a test to take an implicit bias test. It's a very eye-opening exam. I've taken it twice, and I'm one of the 3% of homo sapiens who don't have implicit bias by nature. Yes. Okay. So I generally, I look at someone, and I don't make a judgment. Oh, he's Indian, so that means he's having curry in five minutes, you know, or he's black, that means he's a thief, or he's Jewish, that means yeah. he's got lots of money. Um, as humans, it's, by the way, there's nothing wrong with implicit bias. We exist as a species. Think about this, Carl, or Carl. If, 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 if we didn't have implicit bias, it'd be like, here, kitty, 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 go. Saber-toothed cat just ate your child because he was too stupid and didn't realize there was a threat there. Implicit bias, you know, is important. We survive as a species. If you act on implicit bias in an unfair, unjust way, then you're a bigot or potentially a racist. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so a lot of people don't look at it that way. Uh, these guys are talking about um, Naomi Osaka and LeBron James and their movie studio they made. I heard there's a big kerfuffle with that. Apparently something wrong with the name. I didn't, I didn't really follow that. I don't really follow LeBron James. He's an apologist for Chinese Communist Party, and he is uh, he is a person that enables the imprisonment of Muslims in in, the, in in China. And I just I find him repulsive. Sorry. <laughs> what can I say? I don't like LeBron James. <laughs> I do like Jacques Cousteau, but not LeBron James. <laughs> so what comes next? Uh, what comes next for Caro Charo? Um, are you you got this comedy tour? Are you continue with your journalism? Uh, have you got anything big on the horizon? Other than you're on TikTok now, I didn't know you were on TikTok. So folks, check him out on TikTok. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I've got uh, roll my TikTok a bit more. Uh, look, I'm big into my at the moment. I'm big into uh, the community activism sort of thing. We're just mobilizing the communities a bit more, trying to get them a bit more active. Because um, I believe 2024 coming up, there needs to be some game changes. We need to. I'm looking more of an active citizen. I want my community. I, I unashamedly. I've said this before, uh, you know, people call me a racist because I'm a, I am I, I push a pro-Indian agenda. But I said, lobby groups exist around the world. We, are, we have our own rights and our own ways. And being pro-Indian doesn't make me anti-black. Uh, you know, um, in America, lobby groups exist. I think most of my lobby groups exist. Whether you're lobbying for the rights of uh, Chinese, Mexican, Spanish, Italian, whatever. It's what it is. So I'm just busy pushing. I unapologetically push an Indian agenda. I believe we are being uh, persecuted as a people. That's my opinion. And people believe that same way. Uh, government will have us believe that they are fair, the Freedom Charter, yada, yada, yada. But on the ground, the Freedom Charter is not existing. Uh, my son doesn't have the same opportunities as everybody else. My son can't go to a, a university or medical school. He need to have... Um, higher, higher uh, point system and all of that to get in. So yeah, there is quite a bit of bias, but uh, if we don't fight the system, we're going to get swallowed up. So whatever I'm doing and however I'm fighting the system, whatever I'm doing, when people ask me why I do it, I said, I don't do it for myself because my years on this planet are pretty limited, mm. but I want to sort of pave the way for my son and his children to have a little better life when we're not here. 
Well, I mean, after all, that's what it's really all about, right? You want to leave the world a better place than you found it and leave leave uh, something for your progeny to prosper. And, you know, America, that's been the story of America for centuries. Uh, and now there's been an effort to undermine that and lie about this country. And it's really frustrating. But uh, we may be turning it, we may be reaching an inflection point in this country. People just fed up uh, across the spectrum politically. You know, I saw so many people um, posting on social media. Of course, you take it for what it's worth. People post whatever they want on social media. They lie all the time. But but a, a preponderance of messages from people who were centrist or left of center or Democrats or even some leftists who said, you know, you got no one to blame but yourself on this abortion decision here in the United States to overturn Roe versus Wade. I mean, you people are calling for the termination of life after a child has been born and come out of the womb. And you've just gone too far. You keep pushing the envelope. And the same thing is happening with transgenderism and all these other things. They keep pushing the envelope and to the ridiculous and sublime. And, and people are just We've had enough of it. It's. Uh, I think we're reaching an inflection point politically, and I think that the uh, the Rona scam, political scam that's been affiliated with the actual genuine virus and and disease, has really finally begun to w open people's eyes. I hope that's the case. Uh, people tend because to be. Can I? Yeah. Can ahead. I? Can I identify as a woman at some point? Sure. Why not? I identify as a lampshade because I shed light on the world. <laughs> are, you, are you a lampshade? I'm a lampshade. Because I shed. I shed light on the world. <laughs> Yeah, because I I I, I want to. So 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 does that mean we can just we wherever we are we can identify because we go to stages in life we can just identify whatever we are. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that well, make sense? I'm well, just, um, I, I'm, I, just, I, I'm just coming to terms with that right now that I can identify with. Well, I am in the process. I am in the process of identifying as a Black American. Um, I'm going to overcome my pigmentation challenge, the inherent, yes. the inherent unfairness of my pigmentation challenge, and I'm going to identify as a Black American so that I can get the YouTube Black Creators uh, Scholarship. I'm applying for that, and uh, we'll see what happens. They reject me, and I'll open a class and, action lawsuit against them. <laughs> and and and, no, and nobody can deny you that, right? Because you feel that. I, it's right. Yeah. It's it's right. My feelings matter. Black lives matter. My life matters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, if you if you feel that on the inside, it's what you are. You just you just step in this in this exactly. fatal body with this. Exactly. You know, it's interesting because uh, I've always told people on my channel. I have a, a lot of viewers who are colored, South African colored, uh, and a few Indians, but a lot of colors. And I've always told people, I said, "Yeah, hey, look, brother, I'm with you. I'm colored too. I'm I'm pink. I'm colored." <laughs> So, so have you met any colored people down here and you're going to come and meet them? Oh, well, that's the Cape. I'm going. Okay, so here's the here's the deal. So the, the, the reason the justification for the trip and the outlay of cash is to attend the um, Sevens World Cup in Cape Town. I've been every World Cup since 2011. Oh, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, yeah. yeah, so I'll be in Cape Town for that. And I had to figure a way to do this so I didn't have to pay for extra flights and, and inconvenience and dragging bags around. So I was able to book this ticket, even though it's 34 hours each way, so that I get from Harrisburg to Cape Town, no transport, one place the other, I get there. So that's my, my base. Um, there'll be a few people I know in Cape Town who I'll be able to leave my bags with, take a small carry bag with me. And and then I'll have a, a higher car probably, or people give me free rides, you know, around the Western Cape. I'm going to go up to the Northern Cape where I've never been to Uppington to meet uh, Vian Dutoy and a whole bunch of people up there. I might, if there's time, go to Orania just to do part of. I'm doing documentaries. Uh, that'll be part of what I'm doing while I'm there. And yes. then uh, I will get uh, Hao Tang, of course. I know a lot of people in Hao Tang, and uh, Pretoria is my favorite place. And from there, I'm going to have to have a hire um, and drive down to KZN. I intend to go to the Drakensberg. I will hit the battlefields. I've never been to Spinkop, so I'll try to get that if it's possible. I'm going to get to Blood River again. I'm going to get to Isan Lawana and Rourke's Drift again. And then I'm also going to go back and visit the uh, Elandska, the German Lutheran church that I visited 20 years ago and see what's going on there. I will come down to Peter Maritzburg and I'll try to, if I have time, stay in the Wartburg, the German hotel just north of there. Uh, and then I'll head down to Durban. Uh, I intend to do a video because it's going to be almost six months since the floods and it's going to be over a year since the riots and insurrection. So I'm going to do coverage of that. And then also it's meet and greet. So there's there's you in that area. There's also Trevor Donjane, South Africa's premier bassist. Trevor and I are going to hang out and do some stuff together. And then a lot of my my mods and viewers. I'll have meet and greets with with my audience. So if people want to meet me, it'll be announced before I arrive somewhere. I'm going to be I'll be at Menlin in Pretoria this day. Come hang out with me at uh, you know Ocean Basket or, or you know Mug and Bean or something like that. And then uh, also um, Steve Hofmeyer. I'm going to link up with Steve Hofmeyer. I'm going to try to meet with political parties. Uh, I've been trying to meet up with Steve as well. I need to set that up. I need to meet, meet up with Steve and do an interview with him. Yeah. Well, he is. I, I did an interview with him, but unfortunately, it disappeared because I was unable to download it on my old YouTube yeah. channel before it went away. But uh, that was in August of 2020. I interviewed him. He's kind of he's kind of reticent to do interviews.
interviews, and um, I asked him once, twice since then. He didn't want to do it, but but I am going to meet up with him, and I'm probably going to go to one of his concerts. I'm not one of his biggest fans of his music. I just like Steve for who Steve is, and for his actually for his soapies. I like him when he was on soapies, <laughs> just, <laughs> you know. But uh, his music's okay. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of it. He does. He's got some great songs, but I mean, but I'm, I'm not a huge fan. Of it. There's other South African artists I prefer, but but uh, I'll try to go to one of his concerts. Um, and also, um, there will be two Springboks games while I'm in country, and depending where they they haven't picked the venues yet. Depending where the venues are, if it coincides, then I'll definitely be at the Springboks game and hopefully meet some fans there. My goal is to, to make, sure, make sure you make at least two days or a day or two events so I can give you the chat with Phoenix and out of the Yeah, no, I, that's got to be part of it too. It's going to be yeah, tough because yeah. basically I'll be in town from the 17th of, of August to about the 13th of September to taking out the travel days. So <laughs> just under four weeks. Um, yeah, and I don't usually take people up. A lot of people offer me accommodation or rides, this, that, and the other. I don't usually do that because I don't like to be beholden to people and I feel uncomfortable. But uh, in order to make this affordable, I'm probably going to accept people's offers to stay in their homes and such and, and for free rides and stuff like that. Just other because I mean, otherwise, I mean, a month on the ho in hotels and and rental cars is going to cost a fortune. So, oh, yeah, um, yeah. Sure. so, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort something out. But um, uh, if Dean Chansey's there, well, we'll also link up. I, I went to Houston recently, and he was outside the country, so I didn't see him, but I, I did stay at his residence down there. But it's because you can also stay at my family's house because there are normally 14 people there. There's yeah. now 13. There is space for one more. Cool. It's a super spreader event. I'm there. <laughs> Yikes. Anyway, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's kind of what's the, what the deal is. Uh, the meet and greets are primary. As many as my previous guests from South Africa that I can possibly meet with just to do, even if it's a short conversation. And then also, you know, just try to experience some things. So um, I'm hitting, breaking new ground. I mean, I've been, to, I've been, I've been all over KZN. Uh, I've been all over Zulu country there. I've been in, in Drakensberg. I've, I've, I've been... Uh, the only thing I don't do is beaches. So I, I've been to the beach in Durban, but I, that's not my not my scene. So I haven't really been to them. Uh, I've never been to the Eastern Cape. I've never been to Northern Cape. But I don't know if I'm be able to make the Eastern Cape. But the Northern Cape is definitely going to happen. And uh, the rest of it will be places I've been. But there's going to be time for like, you know, Kruger or stuff like that. I don't, I don't need to see lions, you know. I can watch the jackals eating the carcass of South Africa in the ANC. I don't need to watch the yeah, lions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah, so that's kind of what's coming up. So as we get closer, I'll let you know. And we'll try to coordinate. And I have to be careful. I have to let people know it far enough in advance because some people have their plans. They're going to weddings, they have travel, they're going here, they're going there, they're not available. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to go, oh, great, uh, Caro and I are going to get together and then you're out of town and because I didn't tell you when I'm going to be there. So, what I will do is. I with know, people, we'll, we'll plan in advance and obviously if I make the time, then I'll make the time. That's what. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're gonna, cool gonna, beans. You know. It should be fun, though. It should be a lot of fun and uh, it's going to be cool meeting a lot of people. It has to be fun. Also, we have that curry as well. What's that? Also, we have to have the curry, the hot curry. Oh, yeah. No, somebody just said that in the chat. Uh, it was Hendo said the curries. You know, you guys can have the curries. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, you know, uh, my, my preference is chicken madras, or as I prefer to call it these days, chicken chennai. <laughs> Where did you have? You have that in, you have that in, uh, in, in the U.S.? No, my first chicken madras was in Durban at a Holiday Inn. I was um, I was staying one of the high rise Holiday Inns uh, over twenty years ago, and uh, I uh, I went down the hotel. It was late afternoon. I was hungry. I had driven in town. I'd come down from um, Isan Lawana and driven down, or no, maybe it was from Peter Maritzburg. I think I'd been the Warburg the night before. So I came down to Durban. I get there. It was late afternoon. I check in the hotel, and then uh, I come downstairs to get something to eat because I'm hungry. And uh, I go to the front desk, and the gentleman says, uh, "Sir, where are you going?" It's still daylight. I said, I'm just going to walk out on the promenade. I'm going to look for something. No, sir, you can't go out there. I'm like, I'm thinking, what, the police shut the street down. Is something happening? He goes, no, 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 no. It's not safe. I said, what do you mean it's not safe? Sir, you're white. <laughs> 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 and I looked at him and said, it's going to be okay. I'm in the army. I can take care of myself. So I walked outside. I walked up and down the promenade. I, there was like a place selling hot dogs or something like that. I'm like, you know, or Borvo or something like that. It really wasn't my cup of tea. So I came back to the hotel and there was a restaurant um, and they opened uh, maybe 530, something like that. And so I walked over and they're they just getting ready to open up. And I said, are you guys open? He said, sure. And there's nobody in there. So I sat down. He said, have you ever had Indian before? I said, yeah, I've had it in the States. We had a big conference with Indian doctors from all of America who came to Ohio University when I was a, a student there. And, and we had curries and I ate a lot. It's pretty tasty. Uh, he said, but do you like hot food? I said, yeah, I like Mexican food. He goes, no, no, I said hot food. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> so I said, yeah, okay, what's your scale? One to 10. He said, well, I, well, I can recommend chicken madras if you like chicken. I said, okay. Uh, I said, why don't you give me like a, a seven or eight? He goes, you sure? I said, sure. So he brings it out and I'm sitting there. I'm the only person at the restaurant. I've got my basmati rice and you know, I'm, just, I'm, I'm eating it. And about 10 minutes later, he walks out. And he goes, sir, are you okay? I said, 
was the best meal I've ever had in my entire life. It's so good. <laughs> Tears rolling down my face. My face is bright red like this microphone, that color red. And I got my nose running. My ears are burning. And I was so good. And ever since then, chicken madras is always my favorite. Uh, the best chicken madras I've ever found are in Durban and in Soho in London. Everywhere else is a sad comparison, but I still eat it. But, you know, madras doesn't exist anymore. They renamed it Chennai a long time ago. So I call it chicken Chennai. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, you're talking about that. But let me just enlighten you on cuisine here in Durban. Oh, uh, most white people believe Indian food is like what you say, the kormas and the madras and all of that. But yeah. Durban Indians or South African Indians have a very unique way of cooking themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's not your madras and your kormas and all of that. Yeah. So you need to have a, a Durban style. In fact, India can't cook like the way Indian cooks from India can't cook the way Durban Indians cook. Right. It's different cuisine. Then the entire, it's, it's totally different. So when you come back, you're going to have a, a Durban Indian experience. All right. We now, don't do the coconut, we don't do coconut oils and almonds and all of that. So obviously <laughs> when our forefathers came here, they had to make do with what they had. The sure. Stuff that was here. And then our cuisine is uh, based on that. Absolutely. So if you took me if you took me to a typical Indian restaurant, I wouldn't know what to order because I don't normally eat that type of food. Yeah, well, it's like Chinese food in America. The Chinese don't eat this crap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when, when you come down, you gotta you gotta you gotta share you, you gotta share a bunny chow, maybe a hot bunny chow. Uh, I'm not a fan of bunny chow. I'll, I'll do it just to say I did it, and you can catch me on film. Yeah. But I'm not a fan. But yeah. listen, I, I, th th there are some challenges here. I, I, I'm going to have to leave the onions out, and um, I won't eat lamb. I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> Your beef? I can do beef. I'm not a fan, but I can do beef. But yeah, oh, you like chicken? Gonna, yeah, chicken's great. Yeah. Not chicken. We do chicken. Only, only white meat. I'm a racist. Only white meat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, will you eat something that will you eat something that identifies as a chicken? Well, yeah, why not? I mean, if I identify as a lampshade, I shouldn't discriminate on that basis. <laughs> yes, I, might, I, I might feed you something and I'll say that identifies as a chicken. Will you eat it? You say, okay, yeah. If okay. you feed me go if you feed me goat, our relationship is over, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, chicken it is. There we go. All right. Anyway, so listen, uh, we can probably chat and have fun all day, but I'm sure you got things to do. You were very gracious with your time and very flexible. For those who don't know, and my apologies for this being a late start, but what happened was that normally Vian Tutoy would and I would have done Fireside with the Colonel today, but he is uh, detained, unavailable, and I already had that set, and, and, and Caro and I had a hard time scheduling when he would be available. So he agreed to rush home for 4.30 to come on, and then last night I got word from Vian that uh, he wouldn't be able to make it, so I was able to just the time so that's why we went at the normal time so thanks for all of you for showing up for this those of you watching on his platforms thanks a lot you should come check out my platform i think you'll find some pretty frank discussion and some honest discussion and if i'm wrong i'll admit it i think it's happened once but so i think i admitted that so <laughs> anyway yikes uh, so um any last thoughts before we wrap up anything you want to share or um something on your table something to discuss i mean look uh, before you answer that question before you answer that question, um, and we don't have to talk about this now unless you want to talk a little bit longer and talk about it, but uh, my prediction is that Cyril Ramaphosa is some deep kimchi here. <laughs> he can't cover this up. You know, <laughs> there's not enough. There's not enough shade to cover up what the shady happenings at Pala Pala. But anyway, if you want to talk about that, we can do that, or we can wrap it up. Your call. Yeah, I know. We'll just uh, touch on that. But I, look, I, I, um, we live in South Africa, so nothing is uh, cast in stone. Nothing is. Uh, every day is a new day. Something will come up. Um, as we know, our Gupta brother is sitting somewhere in Dubai. Apparently, they're going to be here, but we know nothing is done till it's done. Yep. So um, it's an interesting time. Um, whatever happens, I don't want. I don't want for the destabilization of our country. You know, for that to happen. When you spoke about the ANC earlier on about the deep divisions, you know, I wish. I wish it's a wish though that even the RET faction or wherever it is, ultimately they must want. What's good for South Africa, not for themselves. But you know that 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 that's just a wish. That whatever they do, we, we don't want to destabilize our country. That people just end up, the poorest of the poor end up in a worse situation. So we can wish for that. Uh, but yeah, my old push from now is that even whatever happens, we as a people, I'm talking about my own Indian community and South Africa and the rest of South Africans, I must say this: that in the past couple of months, especially on TikTok, where TikTok is a good platform. 
a lot of black South Africans are expressing themselves, are expressing their utter disappointment with the you know, you know, as a South African, non-black South African, you don't get to hear what because people believe all blacks support the ANC, all blacks support the EFF, all blacks are against yeah, you know that's nonsense. And that's when these plant I see one of those videos and I share it with my friends for them to understand that look, this is Black South Africa rising against the ANT and saying we've had enough. We have had enough. We, we, we cannot continue in this fashion. You've done this over and over. I mean, they're blatantly coming out and calling it what it is, the BS that it is. And that, to me, is a great move for South Africa and it's a great move for everyone to hear. So that's why these platforms are important to educate. Otherwise, we would never know what... Um, I mean, I know because I tune into platforms, I tune into stations to hear what the rest of South Africa is saying. Others are living in cocoons. You know the guys who just want WhatsApps and they watch TikTok for fun. So sometimes they'd watch a video like that and become educated. Hey, hold on, look what this guy is saying. And I follow those guys on TikTok actually who have a very different mindset to hear why they have that mindset and where it is. So yeah, so there you go. TikTok as well is important for people to express themselves and, uh, and move on. So yeah, the future um, doesn't look great, but it's promising. And we have to live with it, work with it, and do the best we can. If Otherwise, we all just lay down and die, which I'm not prepared to do. Uh, prepared to fight for wherever. And I say fight, not to take up arms, but stand the battle, see what's happening, get active, and, and try to make a difference. I'm, I'm there. Absolutely. I'm with you 100%. You know, and I think it's uh, the height of uh, foolish and stupidity and maybe a bit racist to assume that people only vote one way. I've been telling South Africans, particularly white South Africans, that for over two years that this uh, notion that black South Africans are in lockstep and will always vote for the ANC is, 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 is a tired notion and it's never been accurate to begin with. I mean, I can find lots of black conservatives who would never even dream of voting for the, for the ANC in South Africa. And it's the same thing. You know, people not understanding things. They're assaulting the Afrikaans language now, but 800,000 black Africans in South Africa's first language is Afrikaans. About 200,000 Indian South Africans' first language is Afrikaans. And the people are astounded to find that out, but it's a true story. It's a language spoken by a lot of people, but the, 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 the lack of understanding of what's really going on in South Africa, by South Africans especially, is disheartening. Hopefully eyes are opening up. Your point about a lot of young black South Africans going on TikTok and expressing their anger, it is. It's great to see. And it's the same. I'll tell you what. Um, when I go on TikTok, I don't know what their algorithm is, but it, it doesn't show me leftist hate-wanking nonsense that I'm not interested in. And I really appreciate that from TikTok. It'll gravitate now. Now you might say that's a self-licking lollipop, or you know, um, you know, you're, you're only hearing what you want to hear. But I don't go to TikTok to be outraged by leftists. I go to the New York Times and the Washington Post and and News 24 to be outraged by leftists and listen to their own words on television. I go to TikTok for entertainment and for you know hearing people who share the same views. And the number of Black Americans who are conservative who are angry about what's going on in this country and Hispanics that's on TikTok is off the charts. So many of these people I'm discovering all the time on there. And it's the same thing on TikTok for young black South Africans. It's great to see uh, people actually get a chance to express their voice and show their disdain for what's happening around them. But yeah, excellent. So yeah, we'll definitely be in touch um, about my trip coming up. Maybe we'll get you back on here. And, um, you know, um, we talked about doing a program, you and I, but we both are pretty busy, and so I don't know if we ever get around to it. But you know, maybe once a month sort of thing we talk about last time. Yeah, yeah, let's let's yeah. let's it, uh, things have changed a bit more. I'm more in that space. Okay, uh, but I'm good for that. Maybe around the unrest time, we need to just hook up again, just yeah, uh, reflect on what happened in that period, uh, and we can. We can and I'll, once you send me the link again, I can just share that with the post the next time, so we can move people from my platform onto your platform. Yeah, no, absolutely. So yeah, no, <laughs> I'll just do me a promo poster, and then I'll share the link, and then we can get people on. All right, we'll have to come up with some really catchy Indian slash American name for that segment. We'll, we'll think, you know, <laughs> if we do a regular segment, we'll think of something. Or we'll just use, you know, use that there, Madhur, you know, something like that. <laughs> nah, that'll work, yeah. Cer we educate the world. Certified Madhur, you know, we'll put that, we'll call and, that and, our program. We educate the world, yeah. Exactly. All right, uh, Caro Charo, it's, it's, it's always been a pleasure. Uh, thanks a lot for giving us an update on the Phoenix Accused. Since the media isn't covering it, it's always important. And I'll always be asking that question until that's resolved. Thank you for that and also letting us know. And also for making the point two points that i i mean i appreciate everything you said, but two points really stand out for me number one is um you made it very clear that um relationships between the black and indian community aren't what the media or the government try to portray it as that that's a misnomer that's important for people to understand that people getting along like they always did as soon as the stuff died down and the other one was that hey look uh black south africans don't necessarily love the anc and they're willing to stand up to it so open your eyes and see what's going on anyway last last thought and then we'll wrap up that's it i think we got it no, just thanks 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 for having me i'm in a a better space where I was, uh, but 
a uh, lot more engagement and we just educate uh, what the platform does just educates everyone a little bit more and i'm just uh, thoroughly impressed with your knowledge of south africa and you teach me every day a bit more about my country and, and, and with all the stats so thank you well, thank you. And uh, the whole audience got to learn uh, some things today about Indian culture in South Africa, which I'm sure they appreciate. And, uh, and look, I'm telling my audience now, if he tries to feed me goat, I know what it tastes like. And it'll be, there'll, be, there'll be sparks. There'll, there'll be <laughs> Actually, the right. chances of you trying to feed me goat are a lot lower than somebody uh, in Mpumalanga trying to feed me goat. Just saying. Anyway, <laughs> courage, Charu. Thanks a lot, brother. We'll catch you later. I'll put you in the holding room. All right. All right. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you go. That's the great and wonderful Caro Charo. All right, I appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in. I uh, appreciate your support for the channel. Be sure to give us a like, smash the like button. If you're not a subscriber, watch you become one. We do appreciate it. Help us overcome shadow banning here on the platform because you know it's real. It's out there. God bless everybody. Thanks a lot. We'll catch you here either later today or next time. I did three shorts this morning. Check them out. I hope you enjoy them. Take care, everybody.